I am extremely driven. And what happens when you're not taking care of yourself is you lose your why. You see that you're completing all of these tasks and you're creating all of this content and you're meeting these obligations and you're bringing value to your community, whoever that is, but you no longer know why you're doing it. And it's because your heart and your soul are not being fed. That's where strategic self-care comes in so that you can go back in there and ask yourself proverbially, how am I doing? What do I need right now? And pausing long enough to listen to what the answer is. You are listening to Personal Development Mastery Podcast, providing those with the desire to grow with the simple, consistent actions needed to master personal development and create the life they yearn for. I am your host, Agi Keramidas. A few years ago, I found myself unfulfilled and unmotivated, like I had lost my sense of purpose and my life was merely passing by. Since then, I've been on a continuous journey of personal development that has transformed every aspect of my life. Now, my mission is to inspire you to grow, stand out, and take action towards a purposeful and fulfilling life. In this podcast, I invite myself inside the minds of remarkable entrepreneurs, authors, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, people who share their journey, milestones and learnings for you to be inspired to grow. In each episode, you will find practical action points that you can implement right now. So make sure you follow the podcast to get them as soon as they are released. In today's episode, I speak with Lisa Tolls an award-winning crime novelist, speaker, and blogger. This is actually the second time I speak with Lisa on the podcast. Uh, The previous time was in episode 204, which uh, was about storytelling techniques and strategic self-care. That episode was published almost a year ago, and it has been since in the top 10 most popular episodes. So... I brought Lisa back on the podcast to have a further conversation and expand on the topic uh, of strategic self-care. Let's dive right in. Lisa, welcome back to Personal Development Mastery Podcast for the second time. It's such a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here again. I so enjoyed our first conversation and looking forward to talking with you again today. So am I, and uh, I will actually start with uh, this, our previous conversation, and I will just give a brief uh, reminder, uh, not only for the listener, but also for you and me, just to refresh our memory. So we spoke the beginning of this year, 2022, it was, our conversation was in episode 204, and we spoke about, uh, mainly, it was about strategic self-care techniques for leaders and entrepreneurs, writers also. And also, uh, we talked about storytelling techniques, we spoke about creativity and so on. And this episode, and I told you that in our previous communication, was very popular. It actually went into the top 10 of the most popular podcast episodes uh, very quickly. And it's still, I was checking earlier today, and it's, uh, it's number eight, which is really good considering it's not even one year compared to some other of the episodes that have been there much longer. So it made me realize apart from the obvious that, uh, you know, the conversation was uh, intriguing to people, but it also made me realize that probably my audience um, has more aspiring writers than (laughs) that I assumed that it would be. So it was uh, one of the reasons that I really wanted you to come back and, uh, you know, continue the conversation and go deeper on some of the both the elements of, you know, writing and dealing with the obstacles one has when writing, but also uh, continue with that topic of strategic self-care because it was very useful, very practical in our previous conversation. And 
Thank you. Uh, was, we spoke about your story last time. What I wanted to ask you as a brief introduction from your side today. So between January when we spoke last time and now it is December. Give us a brief overview. How has it been uh, for you? How has your journey been? Wow. Okay. Looking back um, on 2022 since since January, geez, there's a, that's a... That's a lot to gather. Um, just from a from a book standpoint, I have had two books released since then. My my book Hot House was released in June of this year, this summer, and my latest book, The Ritters, a political thriller, was just released November thirtieth, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm I'm kind of thinking that I'm gonna put a book out every six months or so. I mean, depending on my publisher and what she thinks, of course, and in the calendar, but I like the idea of being able to do that to, to give readers another book every six months. And I also changed jobs after 14 years. I did that in October. So I think a lot of big things happened this year. I certainly learned a lot. I'm tapped into a number of leadership groups and I have a peer circle that I work with and I have other business leaders that I meet with and mentors. And I think you mentioned mentor, that you have a mentor in one of our previous conversations. And mm-hmm. just looking back on everything I've learned in 2022, I think there's, I think there's been a lot. I can't, I can't identify, I changed in this way and I changed in that way. It's a little bit more amorphous than that, but I definitely feel the power of that new knowledge and, and also some risks that I took in 2022. I, I wouldn't say I'm a huge risk taker. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily risk averse, but staying at the same job for 14 years kind of shows that I like to set roots in a place. And uh, even though I've worked in the corporate world for a long time, I was very loyal and very dedicated to a certain product. And I stayed there for 14 years and something inside that voice inside told me you're ready for something different now. I didn't leave for any, any catastrophic, catastrophic reasons. I, I still love that product and I still love those people. I'm very close to many of them. It was just time. That's how I described it. And, and I think that's what makes us change. We wake up in the morning and something new presents itself as a possibility. And you start thinking, oh, okay, maybe I could do that now. Maybe it's time to start looking for another role. Uh, maybe it's time to take a chance on this new venture. And something inside gives us permission to take that risk. So I'm I'm happy that that was a risk that I was willing to take this year, and I love uh, I love the new uh, the new position that I have in the new company that I'm that I'm working with, and it's uh, it's like a whole a whole new chapter. Not to make everything related to books, but it is sort of a a whole new chapter in my life. So I'm very happy about that. Um, if I can touch on one thing that you said earlier, you were talking about the popularity of our last conversation. And I, I noted, noted that you had the word storytelling in the title. And I've noticed lately that on a lot of podcasts that I listen to and YouTube videos and courses that I take on public speaking, Um, a lot of them talk about business storytelling. So I think there's a storytelling in the writing world and storytelling is also related to movies and film and video, but there's also um, more, more and more content that I'm reading about business storytelling in the context of public speaking. And I'm still kind of getting my head around that. I'm still learning it. There, there are some mentors and influencers that I follow that are so good at that. They need no preparation. They pick up a microphone, they get up in front of a crowd, and and they just know how to lead into a wonderful topic. There's just a way that you can do it um, that really kind of makes it memorable and draws people in. And that's something that I'm really interested in. In the business world, um, we hear a lot about how how data is terribly important to people, data and metrics and numbers to kind of bring credibility to your topic. Um, But I think the story surrounding the data, the context of it is really what makes people remember you and, and remember your, um, your, your journey. 
Absolutely. And uh, storytelling, we discussed about this in, in our previous conversation, and it is very important. It is what makes someone relate to your message. There were a couple of other things that uh, I got from you, what you were saying. First of all, when you said about changing jobs, I realized that, uh, and actually there was a question there that I wanted to ask you, uh, that someone so prolific in a way, you mean you create so many, I think you have eight books, if I'm not mistaken, uh, published so far. Nine. 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 Nine now, <laughs> right. <laughs> So, and that is not even a full-time thing. I mean, you are working at a full-time job that you changed and you want to make a book every six months or uh, so that is. My question was, what is that motivator that keeps you going in such a, it sounds like a very intense uh, and time intense, I mean, pace of, of doing things. Uh, I... I appreciate that reflection, and I, I know that it does seem like that on the outside. I don't actually do a lot of writing every single day. I do try to write a little bit every day, but um, I, I've, been, I've been having writing and my day job coexisting together for many years now, over, over 20 years. And I have often wondered that if I won the lottery and I, I won a... A, a, a large sum of money and I could afford to to quit my day job and write full time or if one of my books just took off and I didn't have to work a day job anymore I've often asked myself would I have the motivation to write full time so I've always kind of written part time and had a full time job and I've always found ways to sort of fit them in together one way or another and I almost think that Having a full-time day job in the corporate world, I've worked in corporate for, for a very long time, I almost think it feeds my writing. Not because I'm writing about what I see in the corporate world, in, with, about business strategy and things like that, but because they're so different. It's almost like working within the confines of, of a nine to five job, so to speak. It's not always nine to five. Actually, it's usually not, it's usually more than nine to five. But working in that context, it's almost like um, it puts a gate around my creativity. And all day when I'm working, it's just my, my creative energy is waiting to break out at the end of the day. So I almost think that it creates this sort of cre creative backup that I have to focus so deeply on um, on business related concepts and topics and, and skills and deliverables and negotiations and collaborations. And it's almost like the storytelling, the crime writer in me is just can't wait to, to kind of turn that off for the day so I can enter this, um, this place that I go to. I'm not sure what the, what the place is called. I'm sure you have your own name for it too, but the place where my creativity can, can flourish. And, and I'm also one of those writers that I, I can't bring discipline or that much discipline to my craft. I bring discipline. I learned discipline because I'm a longtime musician. I grew up in a family of musicians and I was, I'm a classically trained flutist and I also play piano. I went to music school. Um, so I had heavy duty discipline training, which was so wonderful for me in so many ways. I can't bring discipline to my writing. I'm not one of those people that can say, okay, I want to get this done by this date. And, um, and that's going to require that I write from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. every morning before my day job starts. I can't do it. I mean, I'm, I'm up at six in the morning. I get up early and, um, and I can get myself so that I'm awake enough to do work. But it's kind of like my creativity doesn't wake up until later in the day as a way to go through all of the trials and tribulations and challenges and drama of the day and personal relationships, it takes all of that and it kind of mashes it all up. And that's where the story is born in a way. I don't know. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. It makes me realize how I think I'm the opposite with you because for me, all the, the good parts of my day happen in the morning, creativity, productivity. Towards the, the end of the day, I'm, I'm kind of 
run out of um, <laughs> most of those things and uh, it, it's, it's, it's gradual. Um, we will talk about writing and some of the things. Uh, actually, I wanted to talk about that a little bit later and take a little detour, uh, at least in the beginning of a conversation, and speak about those um, pillars of strategic self-care. I know I'm I'm changing a little bit uh, the subject, but it is something I want to cover for sure. And then uh, we'll go back to writing and uh, also connect it with uh, my own writing project, which we we were talking about that before uh, we started recording. So I'm giving this out as a a teaser to to the listener. We'll come back to that. But... uh, from our previous conversation, uh, there were some really important, actionable, uh, practical uh, steps that you described. And one of them was uh, to celebrate the small uh, wins and also to grieve your losses as, uh, as methods of um, strategic self-care. And I wanted to continue this uh, conversation about um self-care for leaders, for entrepreneurs, for writers, which was uh, our main topic, the previous conversation, and ask you, well, obviously we'll speak about the other pillars that you have, but first uh, share the importance of this self-care, and uh, because for, for many people it is not obvious how important it is. Uh, unless they are in a certain uh, crisis or in a in a burnout situation, then they they have to look at it. But if we could just uh, discuss this briefly as a preface, and then go into the more uh, practical elements. Absolutely, and and I think you brought up a wonderful point too, that we normally think about self care when it's too late to do anything about it, when we're already burned out. And, and the idea of, of the phrase strategic self-care is it brings strategy and planning to, um, to the self-care that you need to sustain yourself as, uh, as a business visionary, as an entrepreneur, as a storyteller, whatever that is. So it's, it's sort of a container that the way I describe it is, is that strategic self-care is for business leaders and visionaries, writers, innovators, movers and shakers. And it brings awareness to the parts of ourselves that we historically ignore to draw deeper meaning and fulfillment from our work, whatever our work is. So the pillars are kind of a set of practices that bring strategy to to understanding and identifying what you really want understanding your why, and creating space for positive change. So um, sometimes when I talk about strategic self-care, I spend a lot of time on debunking myths about it. You know, people think of self-care historically as um, as a meditation practice. That's absolutely self-care. Of course it is. Going for massages or going to the chiropractor to get body work done or Reiki or something like that to kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. keep your body in sync and balance. Those are all self-care. Absolutely. The strategy is, um, is doing that before you necessarily need it desperately and doing it on a regular basis. And the pillars that I have kind of take it like another step deeper than that. Um, So I think of it as kind of a personal mastery and recalibration mindset made up of these easy tactics that bring you immediate value. And that's where the pillars come in. So the the first two we talked about celebrating small wins and grieving losses. And there are, and there are three other ones and, and there are many other um, kind of strategic self-care elements that we could talk about. But when you think about having a message and broadcasting a message and getting people to really understand it. I mean, this is the case with fiction writing or, um, or with digital marketing or with, um, with running a business. You have to keep it small if you want people to understand it. Otherwise, it's just going to be too much. And we already have so much overload. Oh, my goodness. You know, I mean, like our reliance on, um, on the Internet 
and um, and on social media, it's almost like we have to have these subtractive practices so that we can kind of gate and filter what we're seeing every day. Because otherwise, if we don't do that, we just have overload and nothing's going to really stick. Nothing's going to really reach us in that deep way. And so that's why I, I try to contain it into these, uh, these five pillars. I don't know if you want me to talk about those now, but that's, uh, that's how the five pillars came about, is, is keeping the message small. Thank you for uh, your introduction of this and the, uh, what came to me as a clear message, the importance of planning before you actually are in desperate need for, for self-care because you have neglected it for many, many uh, years. So uh, the I would like actually to go to the, the nitty-gritty of it, uh, the, the pillars of it, because... Okay. I have the three titles. I'm just going to share them uh, as I have them on my list. But when I was reading them, uh, just as titles, they are extremely relevant. I think people can either understand them immediately or they can be very intrigued and see, but how is this uh, connected to uh, self-care? So one of them uh, was saying no. And that's such a, a huge uh, topic. The other one was perfectionism, which uh, I believe we talked about just before we started recording. I was telling you about my own um, experiences with my first uh, book. And the last one, which uh, actually is something that I would like to focus more than the other two, so I'm just stating that, was asking for help. Okay. Oh, great introduction and lead in there. Um, yeah, so... You, you've already mentioned the first two pillars, celebrating small wins and grieving losses. And when we look at kind of the container holding these all together, I think collectively what these pillars are um, is they create a method for us to get out of our own way, to prevent us from kind of sabotaging and limiting not just our success and our progress, but the happiness and the meaning that we derive from all of the activities that we're doing. We work so hard, Bus business owners, business visionaries, content creators, writers, what, whatever, whatever like your work is, whatever you're doing, people work incredibly hard. We're incredibly driven And I think what happens when you keep driving yourself without stopping to pause and, and take a breather and assess is you end up getting burned out. You've already mentioned burnout and, and burnout is a very real thing. And um, my personal story about strategic self-care is just to be completely transparent is they, they were born really out of my own failures to take care of myself. Yeah, I am, com uh, I am extremely driven. And what happens when you're not taking care of yourself is you lose your why. You see that you're completing all of these tasks and you're creating all of this content, and you're meeting these obligations, and you're bringing value to your community, whoever that is, but you no longer know why you're doing it. And it's because your heart and your soul are not being fed. That's where strategic self-care comes in, so that you can go back in there and ask yourself proverbially, how am I doing? What do I need right now? and pausing long enough to listen to what the answer is. And the answer might not come to you right away. I mean, you might have to do that four or five times before your, before your inner self, your, your inner heart listens and says, wow, finally, you got around to asking me, okay, well, I have a laundry list of what I need, and then you better get your pen ready. And, and, and again, we come back to what you said, Aggie, about um, not waiting until it's far down, down the process, you know, asking early in the process and, and starting that as you're just starting out. But, you know, these concepts can be brought to any, any stage of where you are on your journey. So yeah, celebrating small wins, grieving losses and, uh, and saying no and perfectionism. There's so much to say about those. And then asking for help. That's the one that you wanted me to address. I think asking for help has so many pitfalls 
you know, um, when you think of the word efficiency, the word efficiency brings me a lot of happiness. And the word efficiency has also brought me tremendous unhappiness. I think I'm an extremely organized and efficient person. And efficiently, uh, efficiency just, um, just uh, I, I'll, I'll say it again, it just makes me happy. Like bringing order to chaos is something that I'm extremely good at and something that I absolutely love in, in my core. And the bad thing about efficiency is it can go too far. And it ends up being like a machine that I turn on and I just can't turn it off. And it could be 11 o'clock at night or one in the morning. And I just have try in the past, previously, I just had trouble turning it off. And asking for help is a way that kind of calls a timeout and acknowledges that you're just a human being and that you don't have to finish everything to 100% completion each and every time. So again, asking for help relates to perfectionism. Perfectionism relates to saying no, and they all kind of like fall in together sort of. But I think asking for help relates to having a knowledge of our capacity and our limits. And and it involves kind of an ego management in a way because you're acknowledging, I can't do everything on my own. And sometimes that's hard for people. Sometimes that's hard for me, you know, acknowledging I'm, I'm not superwoman. I try to be superwoman and, and I'm not, <laughs> or I can be for a short time, but eventually it's going to, it's going to power out and I'm going to be in a very bad place. So I think having that ego management and self-awareness um, so that you can say, I can't do this all alone, I think is tremendous care for your heart and your soul and your creative mind and your, and your productivity. And I think it can be really, really useful to just say, um, I need help with this part of my project. Would you be able to assist me? I want to take a short break from this episode and quickly let you know about something I'm really excited about. For me, having a podcast made a tremendous difference in my life's journey and I know the kind of impact it can have on one's personal development. And that is why I'm so passionate about helping coaches who are ready to amplify their message and reach a global audience by creating, launching and growing a top quality podcast, even if they aren't tech savvy and are limited on time. Maybe you have thought about having your own podcast, but you don't want to go through the time-consuming learning process of how to create, launch it, how to record, edit, host, and so on. If you said yes, I have a solution for you, something that takes away all the complexity and allows you only to concentrate on creating quality content. Go to my website, agikeramidas.com, to find out more and to get your free copy of my guide about creating and launching your podcast. All right, let's jump back to the episode. All right, so so when we look at the need for asking for help, I think some people might not know how to actually do it how to kind of relinquish control over something to get someone to assist you with one part of it. And I think, um, I think like any of the five pillars, starting small is a reasonable way to get yourself in a groove so that you're thinking about that on an ongoing basis. You might be working on a project and there might be some data entry that's involved, some kind of not bookkeeping, but, um, but some kind of manual work that's part of the project. Um, project. You could ask someone if they would assist you with part of it so that you can meet a deadline and choose someone that you trust, explain to them what the project is, and then give them the necessary resources so they can do it, and then step back from it and let it happen and let the support come to you. And I think that's worth celebrating because once you do that, you can do it again in other contexts too. And it just sets up a great model so that you know, and you're constantly reminding yourself, I don't have to necessarily do all this myself. I can ask someone to, to help me out. If, if you're a business owner, if you're a content creator, if you're a writer, you might ask for help when you, when you're putting a book out to market 
If you're working with a publisher, the publisher might have expectations that you're going to help promote the book. You might not know very much about promotion, or you might know a lot about promotion, but you just have no time to devote to it. So you can go to um, to one of those sites um, and hire a vendor, hire um, someone to support you for one of those parts of the process. You can hire someone to do some online promotion, some social media promotion, set up a giveaway campaign for you. That way you're writing the book and you're perfecting the book and you're working with an editor to bring it to the highest degree of polish that you can, but you're going to hire some external vendors um, to support the next parts of the process. So I think it ends up being a win-win for, um, for everyone involved. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that I, I think is, is really important to looking at what prevents our happiness and fulfillment. So asking for help is the fifth, um, is the fifth of those pillars. Do you want me to go in and talk about the other two or do you have any comments or thoughts before we get there? If you would give me a brief comment about the other two, and I will give you my comments collectively, because I already have comments and my next question, but I would like a brief comment about the saying no in particular, and also perfectionism, but uh, perfectionism in particular is something that I have spoken quite a bit, I feel, in my previous podcast uh, conversations, but saying no and the importance of saying no and knowing when to say no and for what reasons, that is something that I would uh, I would love to hear your, uh, your thoughts and your insights about it. I think there's so much to say about saying no and, and perfectionism. And when we think about self-care, the idea of saying no puts us in touch with our fears and uncertainties. And I say fears because what saying no really implies is that you're going to learn to disappoint people and not care. <laughs> but who can do that? I mean, no, no one wants to disappoint people, right? But we have to have a, a tool in our tool set and some sort of mechanism where we're at least willing to do that sometimes in the interest of taking care of ourselves, in the interest of properly managing our, our capacity, in the interest of understanding that we, um, that we can't spend 100% of our, our time on 100% of our projects. We have to take that 100% and divide it up strategically prioritizing the things that are of highest importance to either um, meeting our work deadlines and obligations or highest importance to taking care of our families or taking care of ourselves. It's a really hard thing to negotiate. And um, I think saying no can be incredibly hard for people because we don't want to disappoint people. We want their acceptance. We want their love and support. We want their accolades saying, great job. Yeah, you, you really went the extra mile. You really went overboard and, um, and you helped the company do this. At what cost, though? And um, I, that's why I think saying no is um, it, it's an important topic and it's a very thorny, challenging topic because no one wants to think about it. No one wants to do it. And so by, by writing and speaking about this, I'm, I'm finding that I'm cultivating dialogues that are um, often really meaningful to people because we're collectively finding ways that we can have our cake and eat it too. You know, of course, we, we could be productive and just, you know, say yes to everything. And, you know, you run the risk of being a people pleaser and not having good boundaries or what's worse, not having any boundaries. And again, these five pillars came from my only came from my own shortcomings and my own failures. And I spent many years of my life being like that saying yes to everything and and taking on too much work. And what happened? I got burned out and then that's not good for anyone. So by saying no, you're you're letting people know that you're self-aware. You're letting people know that you are strategic about how you spend your energy 
and you're not just going to take on something because someone wants you to, even if the person, even if the person who is asking you is terribly important to you, important to your success, important to your family by saying no once in a while. And by having that skill and that mechanism that shows a wonderful preservation of self and, and wonderful care. So um, how do you do that? How, how do you say no? One of the ways that I have learned how to do this is by saying, not now. So you're not exactly saying, no, I'm not doing this. Good luck with that. Do it yourself. <laughs> That's a little harsh. So, <laughs> so you can be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more friendly about it by saying, I'm not able to do that right now. But if you ask me in two or three weeks, I think I will have more time in my schedule and I might be able to take that on. Or you could say, um, no, I can't, I, I can't do all of that, but here's what I can do. I could do these two pieces and have them done by this amount of time. So I, and I think all of those are good skills to have. I, I think it's, it's a good tool to be able to say, you know, to someone who's asking you to do something unreasonable that you don't want to do, it's a good skill to be able to say, no, I can't do that. And to just close your mouth. And let the and let the moment be awkward, and just sit there in the awkward moment, and let the person just deal with it. Deal with the reality of your good boundaries and your self awareness and your self mastery, self mastery, and say, "No, I can't do that." It's it's hard. It's really really hard to do. But once you do it once, you can do it again. And if you can do something twice, you can do it every day. So you could practice um, saying no either to people who are not terribly important to your well-being or your career, or you could start saying no um, about things and tasks that don't matter very much. So let, let me talk about these two examples. So you could say, someone might say, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. It could be someone that you're talking to um, in in a shopping mall or in a grocery store. Someone asks you a question and and, uh, and they want you to do something and you could say, no, sorry, I'm not able to. Mm -hmm. So that's a person that's a stranger. They don't mean a lot to you. And so what that means is there's not that much risk saying no, saying no to that person. Or you could say no to someone who does mean a lot to you, someone in your family who wants you to do something. And you could say, no, I'm not able to do that. I just have too much going on today. Sorry. Um, so, so that way it's, it's someone in your family, someone who loves and supports you, and they will most likely understand if you say no. Now, I've had people tell me, I've had people refute that and say, what are you talking about? My family is incredibly demanding, and I could never say no to them. And I think, I think that's true in some contexts. So do it with small things. Say, um, say no, or say not yet, or say not now, or say no, I can't completely do that, but I can do this. Having the word but in there is a great modifier because you're not being obstructionist and you're not being rude. You're just being realistic. You're saying, I, I can't do that right now, but what I can do right now is this. So there are ways that you can um, kind of modify it so it's not so scary and and so it's not so um, obstructionist so that you're taking care of yourself but you're also practicing it you know I, again if if you practice saying no um i think it it eventually will get less scary and feel um less risky and it'll it'll start to feel good and what you'll find is it can be extremely empowering to have that skill it certainly is empowering and uh, you do get better, you improve when you do that. And what you said that it is a matter of really setting the, boundar the boundaries and having the, the awareness that, you know, if even if I would love to do it or even if I must do it because of our relationship, I simply don't have the, the time, the resources, the, the ability to do it right now that really uh, shows the other person that, you know, you are aware of what's going on. I think it's in, in many ways it's better to say a no or a, a more diplomatic not yet, as, as you said, rather than rushing and saying yes because you have to or because you're used to it or because you don't want to disappoint people or uh, you want their acceptance. And then not being able to fulfill 
your promise, your yes, because it was really impossible. So <laughs> that, I think, will put you in an even more uh, disadvantaged position rather than at the outset saying that I'd love to do it, but I can't do it right now or whatever else is appropriate for, for the situation. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great uh, skill, as you said, to have. And I like the the suggestion to start with uh, small things that will not, uh, you know, get you divorced or get you out of your job. Just start <laughs> with uh, smaller things. Practice uh, that so when the the bigger one comes, you are more uh, confident <laughs> in using it. Uh, I have found exactly. personally for me that uh, it gives me also a level of self respect when I do it, and I mean. You know, when there are genuine reasons, I'm not doing it because I don't feel like it. I'm, I'm, I'm saying no because I genuinely don't have the bandwidth for it. It would put me on a tremendous stress and I probably wouldn't be able to do it to the best of my abilities just by saying yes. So it's, it's great coming back to what you said about setting boundaries and being self-aware of what it is that you can do, what you can't do and... I think we all of us ha- have this ability to to ascertain what what it is that we can do, and I think to some extent, for me anyway, I have this kind of an instinctive um, awareness that if I if I'm asked something, I feel like the pressure, and if I am able to say no, I feel a, an instant relief. I don't feel worse that I've said no to them. I actually feel so much better because. <laughs> you know that gives me frees me up to do what I have to do at that particular uh, time. So uh, thank exactly. you. That was a very uh, useful, I think, and practical uh, answer. And Lisa, there is one other thing, another question that stems out uh, from all these, uh, you know methods, shall we say, or pillars, as you call them, of self-care. My question is that, in many ways, none of them is something completely, you know, revolutionary or something that you've never thought before. They are common sense. Mm -hmm. Yet, even though we are aware that we should be doing more for our self-care, still we don't do them do you think there is one more prevalent reason i'm sure there are many but uh, what do you think stops most people from uh, taking care of of themselves the way that they know deep down that they should i'm so glad you asked that i i think that's um i think that's one of the most relevant questions there are about self-care and i think one of the answers is habit we just get used to doing things a certain way. We get used to over productivity. We get used to ignoring ourselves. We get used to that kind of mindset of go, 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 go. Um, and we don't really have a mechanism for that sort of time out. So I think habit is one of them. And I think fear is another one. You know, I mean, like when, when we look at, um, when we look at especially the saying no and the perfectionism, Um, And and I think the asking for help, I think we might have an underlying fear that we will no longer be loved and supported and accepted if we don't meet everybody else's expectation. And it's really difficult to have the personal power. You mentioned confidence in your last uh, comment, to have the power and the confidence and really the trust and the faith that the relationships that we have that we have cultivated, that those relationships are gonna are gonna support us. We have drawn those people into our orbit, into into our personal space, and um, the reality is that I think those people will respect us more if we have these boundaries. But it's it's really hard to get that started, and to and, and I think it requires having a conversation with yourself about I want to live a more authentic life. I want to feel like I own more of my life. I want to feel like I own more of my schedule and my time. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to create some gates and some boundaries so that I can save this sacred space in here that's just for me. 
that's just for writing my book. That's just for writing poetry or painting pictures or, or snowboarding or surfing or whatever it is that feeds you, whatever your bliss is, you're going to create those boundaries and you're willing to take the risk by saying no to someone who means something to you. You're going to take the risk because you're willing to disappoint people that you love or care about because there's a higher purpose involved. And that higher purpose is you. You're willing to negotiate that and you trust that by doing that, you're going to build healthier relationships. So there, there's so much that can be gained here. And especially, um, especially you developing that deeper relationship with yourself and going into that separate place and asking yourself, what do I need? How do I feel? Thank you. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Thank you for your answer. And uh, I would like to um, you know, conclude this conversation, from my part anyway, by asking you to uh, share with the listeners uh, where they can find more about you, particularly about these self-care uh, topics that you discuss. And uh, of course, uh, then your parting words and anything else that uh, you can add. For me, it's been a really delightful and very useful conversation. Thank you, Agi. I so, so appreciate our conversations because I think you're so insightful and I think that you and I have a lot in common and we're on very similar paths. So I, uh, I, I appreciate that alignment. Um, if people want to learn more about strategic self-care, I do have a site that I started and the site is strategic self dot blog. Mm -hmm. And they can also learn more about me and my writing at Lisa tolls.com. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm still working through all of these five pillars. I, I don't have them completely figured out. I'm in a continuous mode of self-discovery and using them more. I, I just got another, I just got a new job. Like I was talking about after 14 years being at the same job and I've never needed these pillars more. I don't do them all the time. I'm still negotiating with myself, still, you know, making myself kind of pause and take a time out. And it's, it's a continuous process. Um, for me, I'm, I'm balancing my, uh, my day job work, which means a lot to me and balancing my writing and trying to fit both of those into the container of the 15 hours a day that I'm up or 18 hours a day. And that's, uh, that I'm going to continue to do that in the future too. I'm, I have a new work in progress. I'm working on a new thriller and I also have a new book that's coming out next June. The book is finished, but there's still so much to do. As you know, you're, you're a writer. There's, uh, there's <laughs> still the final editing to do and, and getting reviews. And it's, it's a lot. Mm. Being a writer is its own full-time job, but you understand that too. Lisa, thank you very much for our conversation. I really appreciate you coming back to the podcast and uh, sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you for listening and I hope you got great value from today's episode. And if you'd be so kind, please take a moment to leave me an Apple Podcasts review sharing how personal development mastery has made a difference to you today. Until next time, stand out, don't fit in, 